Um, I remember listening to an interview that you did with him on your, on your podcast and you were doing an impression of him in front of him, yeah. which must have been quite a challenge. It's always a bit cheeky to do it in front of the person because what are they supposed to do? It's awkward yeah. for them. Um, I did Blair in front of Blair a couple of times. I mean, I think actually, Ian, if I were to pick one, the one that I prefer doing, I think it would be Tony Blair, actually. Because, you know, without being too you know, self-aggrandizing about it, what I would say, actually, is, yes, there's the body language element to it, and I think the eyes are kind of there in the mouth, but it's the way that his voice has aged, and you can hear it in the way that it, you know, that kind of, particularly the way he says, my party. Yeah. And there's a real, he says that word so unusually. So that's my favourite one to do. Hey, I remember saying to William Hay that, mm. actually, it was meeting him. I realised he's slightly more camp in person. And he hums in between each word. There is a, a constant noise in being on LBC. You will have heard it. And of course, as many people before me have said, there's that at the back. Sort of the Eddie Waring. There is, yeah. <laughs> it's, it, it, he is really fun to be. It's actually a very pleasant sound. So come out of your mouth. Um, so he, Trump is, what I love about Trump is it's the mixture of the rant. And then the very soft, we're going to build and we're going to do it and people don't believe it. They're bad people and I feel sorry for them, I really do. And this, you know what's odd about him is, what I think a lot of people don't get is, there is a, there's an earnestness to this man. He really wants to, the moment he's on a stage, he really wishes he'd done his homework, I think. Because... <laughs> Don't we all? There's a, but there's that element where France is... We just hear it. You, you could pick any country in the world where he would want to be a gracious guest, but he's not done the homework. France is a beautiful country and many, many good people come from here and I know they do and I know many, many French people, are, they're great. They do great things and I know many people here. They're doing them. They're doing them so well. and We love what they do. We have many... We have much respect for them. In America. He wants to talk, he wants to pay homage, but he's got no idea what he's on about. <laughs> and I think that is when he's just, when that mind is trying to open but it's empty, is the funniest thing to channel about him. And, and do you enjoy the impression side even more than just delivering a punchline? It is fun to, to pretend to be someone else and to know, because it's a form of observational comedy, is to, you know, with, with uh, you know, Paul Schultz and these, uh, actually, I. Ian, you know, the, 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 the look, that slightly befuddled way to... You know, I will pay tribute to... Uh, what was it? B, not the BBC. LBC, yes. You know, that sort of... Blah, 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 the, the, the kind of deliberate bumbling element see, of I, it. I have interviewed him many times with him sitting exactly where you are now. And the, the one thing that he always does in interviews, he doesn't do what you're doing now. He never looks you in the eye. Oh, wow. He's always looking around the studio because he knows that it's more difficult to interrupt him. But also, isn't that a lack of courage? Isn't that he's worried about catching I don't know, but I know every single interview. And, and every single interview, and I haven't interviewed him now for four or five years, um, but he would uh, do a monologue. <laughs> and I would have to explain to him, Boris, that the idea of an interview is that I ask you a question, you answer it, I then do a follow-up. Yes, of course, great man, great man. <laughs> yes, Ian Dill, you, you should vote for... Uh, you know, uh, but, but, is, no, is it not the case? Uh, you, you, all you need to do is just sort of flit quite quickly between two separate... Uh, and, uh, and get the, where are we now? The, 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 the national thought, yes, the age is. You know, sort of have the, both descriptions in your mind and just sort of flip-flop between the two of them. Uh, and lots of grandstanding. And, and, and then it, it, the funniest thing about him, I think, is the fake earnestness. No, I, I'm so sorry. You know, the, the, the contrite. No, I, I, I knew, I knew. And he doesn't last long. You know, two questions and you, he's up again going. But watching Boris Johnson pretend to be sorry for anything in itself is very funny. That's the comedian and impressionist Matt Ford. And you can hear our full conversation by subscribing to the Ian Dale All Talk podcast on Global Player. And that conversation will be available first thing tomorrow morning. Coming up, it's Tuesday's Cross Question. With me in the studio, Lord Jonathan Marlin, Conservative peer and former minister. He's also the chairman of the Commonwealth Enterprise and Investment 
Government Council. Alice Denby is Opinion and Features Editor at City AM. She's got a new job. And Kevin Craig is Chief Executive of the Public Relations, Relations Agency PLMR. He's also the Labour candidate in Central Suffolk and North Ipswich, I think if that's right, isn't it, for the next election. And Jonathan Liss, Labour activist and political commentator, they are here to take your calls. 0345 6060 973. You can text 84850 and you can watch us on Global Player. On your radio, on Global Player and... Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC. From Global's newsroom at 8 o'clock. The Deputy Secretary General of NATO has told LBC the UK should be prepared for something close to a war in the future. In an exclusive interview with us, Mitch Jonah has said nations must be ready for more shocks similar to the pandemic. I think all of us have an obligation to be ready. Yesterday it was a pandemic. Tomorrow could be, God forbid, something from climate change. Uh, the next day could be something close to a war. Senior defence officials have suggested recently that some form of conscription should be introduced in the UK. An MP who admitted giving the numbers of other politicians to a scammer has voluntarily resigned at the Tory whip. William Ragg, who is stepping down at the next election, will now sit as an independent. Officials at UEFA say they're working closely with authorities over an alleged terror threat against this week's Champions League fixtures. We're told there is a robust policing operation at the Emirates this evening as Arsenal face Bayern Munich. A Nobel Prize winning physicist Professor Peter Higgs has died. The subatomic particle the Higgs boson was named after him he was 94. In the city, the FTSE 100 is closed down eight points at 79.34. The pound buys $1.26 and €1.16. LBC Weather. With Ripple Energy. Climate action you can be proud of. Clear for most overnight with some showers and strong winds in Northern Ireland. A low of freezing, bright for most tomorrow with a yellow weather warning for rain in parts of Scotland. A high of 15 degrees. From Global's newsroom for LBC, I'm Josh Bancroft. This is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation, Cross Question, with Ian Dale. Hello and welcome to Tuesday's Cross Question. I'm Ian Dale. It's two minutes past eight. Let me tell you who's on our panel tonight. We have Jonathan List, political commentator. Kevin Craig, Chief Executive of the Public Relations Agency PLMR, who's a Labour candidate for the next general election in Suffolk. Alice Denby is Opinion and Features Editor at City AM. And Lord Marlon, Jonathan Marlon, Conservative peer and former minister. He now chairs the Commonwealth Enterprise and Investment Council. We'll find out what that does a little bit later. If you'd like to ask them a question, the number to call 0345 6060 973. You can text 84850. And you can say, Alexa, send a comment to LBC as well as watch us on Global Player. Call 0345 6060 973. Tweet at LBC. Text 84850. Cross question with Ian Dale. This is LBC. Well, let's go to our first caller. It is Tony in Horsham. Tony, hi. What would you like to ask? Good evening, Ian. Um, Alan Bates at the Post Office IT inquiry today said he blames officials more than he does ministers. Well, why uh, does the media, um, why is it never interested in officials, only ministers? That's a very good question. Um, I must admit, whenever I criticise civil servants, as I have done quite often on this programme in all sorts of different areas, I'm immediately uh, assailed by people saying, you shouldn't be criticising officials, it's the ministers that are responsible. Or well, Jonathan Marlon, you have been a minister. <laughs> um, <laughs> does it lot, does mate. it frustrate you when sort of mistaken advice that you've been given maybe turns out to be completely wrong, but it's the buck stops with you? Well, of course uh, it does, Ian, but uh, it's a sort of two-way thing. Ministers should direct and officials follow, and nothing a, a civil servant enjoys more, actually, is being told and put in one direction. So part of it is lack of leadership from ministers, of course, but also uh, it is then the officials making up what they think is the route to travel. Uh, I think there is a big problem now in this country in that uh, civil servants are making up the route to travel. Uh, we've seen recently that uh, announced uh, this week that uh, 
Uh, there's going to be a strike because civil servants are refusing to come back to work at all uh, and that they intend to work from home. So there's going to be a strike for that because they're being asked to come back for two days. So there is this now this mismatch between leadership and, um, and service, if you want, for a better word. Uh, which will get worse because what tends to happen is six months before an election, the civil service down tools in terms of following ministerial uh, direction. Which that's is quite, where we are now. Which basically. is quite, which is quite right, by the way, because they don't want to prejudice the situation when a new government gets in. I don't have any problem with that. But we do have and have had in the last few years a real issue uh, between government and civil service. And looking at this from the post office point of view, I mean, it is as clear as night follows day, isn't it, that, that officials did give ministers duff advice on what was happening in the post office during those years. Uh, without doubt. And, uh, but at such times they were giving them good advice and sometimes the ministers weren't following, uh, uh, as we have seen. Sometimes they wanted to brush the problem under the carpet. And this problem has been brushed under the carpet for years. It's an utter utter disgrace. I was actually, I wouldn't say blissful because it's not blissful, but I, thank God I was unaware of it when I was in government because naturally one would have wanted to get to grips with the thing. It is one of the most shocking things I've ever come across in this country. It's a travesty of, dust, of justice which is utterly disgusting and reflects very badly on all governments because it has been all governments and all the civil service and indeed the official, the the direction of uh, the leadership of, of the post office. Jonathan Liss. Well, I would echo a lot of what Jonathan has just said on that particular issue. This is a huge, all-encompassing scandal um, which doesn't only have one culprit. I suppose in answer to Tony's question, the answer is that officials can't answer back. Um, they are sort of covered by uh, sort of civil service rules and ultimately ministers have to carry the can. Ministers, the buck stops with ministers, ministers the ones who are ultimately accountable, certainly ultimately accountable to the public, even if they might not be elected to the position <laughs> as uh, Jonathan will, will know only too well. Um, so there is, there has been a problem for so many years, this particular issue that it wasn't gaining um, traction and we know, and Private Eye was talking about this for many years by the way, so people who are reading Private Eye would have known very well what was happening with the post office and how post office uh, officials were doing everything they could to cover up the scale of the scandal and to deny that there were problems with the with the software even when it was painfully apparent to everybody and carrying on prosecutions even when the software had been exposed as um, so so flawed and I think that it's of course, the people directly responsible at the post office have to, to carry the can, in addition, of course, to the people at Fujitsu. And you know, that is a, a new it's a, it's a subplot, I suppose, about how much Fujitsu is going to take responsibility and how far they should be involved in government tenders going forward. But ultimately, when you have a public service, in, you know, in common with all kinds of walks of public life, uh, you have ministers who have to take responsibility. I'm not saying that any minister should resign. It doesn't seem as though there are ministers currently in the departments who have added to this, to this scandal, but there should certainly be full government apologies. And obviously the government can do something right now by expediting the compensation uh, to those wronged um, sub-postmasters. And it seems that they're still dragging their heels on that. Understand me. And I think the worst thing about this scandal is how many fissures in society it has exposed. I mean, it's the, the fact that it took the heroic campaign of Alan Bates and ultimately an ITV documentary to get people to pay attention to this, that, that it was a, that it's a case of the little guy versus officialdom, that so many people refused to take responsibility. Um, and I think we've got to we got to ask, you know, why why did this happen? And I think part of it is because um, there has been a, a tendency for ministers to try and devolve responsibility away from themselves to Quango's an arm's length body. There is a failure of accountability within our democracy. Um, and that's what's caused this scandal. And we saw a similar dynamic at play with the Windrush scandal. It bubbled away under successive governments for years. People refused to get a grip of it until really, really terrible... Uh, terrible <coughs> instances were exposed. And I think we really need to ask, why is our democracy failing people like Alan Bates? 
Um, let's just give a little bit of background to this. Alan Bates was asked by the Horizon Inquiry today about the stalling of his campaign to get justice for victims of the scandal and told it that he, and this is a quote, holds the civil service more to blame in a lot of these instances why things never progressed at the time because I'm sure between them and the post office briefing ministers they were briefing them in the direction they wanted to brief them in not what was for the benefit of the group or the individuals here. I hold the officials far more guilty in all of this than politicians. Well, Kevin Craig, an incoming Labour government could face similar issues. What what do you think can be learned from this? Well, I think one of the, the most powerful things that he said was how he felt that the post office wanted to make an example of him, you know, teach a lesson. Um, and this picks up on a, a, a theme that I'm sure most of us have experienced in, 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 in public life, which is that people can sometimes feel the system is very unwilling to, to listen to them, even when they have a case. And, you know, Part of my experience in life includes many years as a, an elected councillor and chairing a major planning committee in, on a London authority. And I remember at times almost being told by civil servants, officers at local or national level, this is how it must be. And the challenge is, is that ultimately politicians who can be fired and who can answer back have, have, have the responsibility ultimately for taking the, the decisions. But I, I, I can see very easily how this situation occurred. Um, it occurred, as we all said, across multiple political administrations. But one of the interesting ideas I've, I've seen talk of, if Labour were to be given the offer, the honour of uh, serving after the next election, is some formal role in government where somebody's job is is to to be alert to the, what's taken for granted, the idea that things work properly. Because time after time, we've seen stuff happen that just shouldn't. I mean, everyone's been very articulate here about the outrageous um, actions that, that happened to the sub-postmasters. What people are interested in is, how do we stop it happening, happening again? Because in the way, it's the, it's not just officialdom that's failed here. It is the political system. Uh, Jackie Smith, my podcast partner, was telling me that she asked the first question in the House of Commons on this back in two thousand and nine. And you think, well, mm. um, and it was. We know from the ITV documentary that James Arbuthnot, the Conservative MP, mm. was sort of hammering away at this. Um, but still, nobody took it seriously. Whether it was ministers whether it was civil servants, whether it was people in the post office, they just all stuck to a pre-agreed line. And I don't know what you do in government to change that. Well, I think when we're all familiar with what happened over many years here and, and, and the reality is that it, it looks increasingly like officials, you know, did stop elected politicians from actually taking a grasp of the issue. Po elected politicians in this country do have the ability to intervene in these, in, you know, they, they can, if they're courageous and they don't mind how much noise they cause, they can stop things like this happening but, but if you're constantly told by your civil servants by people in the post office don't worry minister no nothing to see here move along i mean you've got to have a reason to then keep questioning them haven't you well your reason sorry to interrupt your reason is people like james abuthnot yeah. who were mps were banging on the door mm. and frankly the ministers should have taken notice they'd go back to uh, the um, department and they'd say, you know, what about this? And when Abuthnot's done it for the third time, you kind of sort of think, yeah, well, let's have a good look at this. So you should have, they should have had a good look at it in, in that particular instance. And actually the governments beforehand should have had a good look at it and the subsequent government should. But the, 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 I, I can't say strongly enough, having served I don't know, 17 years in, 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 in government and run for parliament before, I, I think about things like we, we had a big campaign in London, the London Bridge, which we, Boris wanted to, to put through, right? Garden Bridge. Garden Bridge even, thank you, Ian. <laughs> the Garden Bridge, London Bridge, I think that's been done already, hasn't it? I think that has yeah. been. Yeah. And, um, not, and not sold. <laughs> we were told the Garden Bridge, you know, it, that it had to happen, it couldn't be turned down, and the pressure... I mean, that's what politics is. You know, it's, it's a fight. It's always a fight. 
I think there also has to be a lot more uh, sort of like weight given to whistleblowing, and there is such a culture of of stopping whistleblowing in this country and not listening to whistleblowers. Yes. You know, having the entire machinery of the state you sort of launched against those people. You see it in the NHS as well all the time, and so that has to be part of it that people are protected and they are listened to when they do come yeah. repeatedly but, 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 but with then, issues. Then you look at this Johnny Mercer issue, which we've talked about on the program quite a bit over the past couple of weeks, where he's refusing to give names of people who've blown the whistle on uh, events in Afghanistan to him to this inquiry on pain of being put in prison. But that's slightly different isn't it? Because the, the inquiry is saying that those people will be given guaranteed confidentiality and the, the, the chair of that inquiry no such thing. the chair of that inquiry no, in no. Is, is saying that if they don't have access to those whistleblowers they can't actually sort of implement, the, they can't actually con- you know, execute the inquiry properly, they can't get to the bottom of what the British Army actually did and so that is one reason why they are sort of very insistent but, but, but you that Mercer should give them the details. If he does do that, which I don't think he will, but if he does reveal the names, there won't be a single whistleblower in this country that thinks that, they, that it's safe to do it again. If their if their identities are absolutely guaranteed and if they are assured that they won't face consequences for having blown the whistle, not necessarily for Would what might... Would you trust a guarantee like that? If it, was sure ba- if it was backed up by legal no. force... Yeah. Well, you're a journalist. You know the importance of protecting this your is, sources. I know, this is what this is what makes me a little bit uneasy about it. But this is not quite the same thing because this is this is a statutory inquiry uh, which is trying to establish the details of what the British Army might have done if the British Army might have committed war crimes. That's in everyone's interest to understand. And so, it, so people who have potentially committed very very serious crimes can be prosecuted. And if the inquiry is not allowed to know who, who those people are and or what the substance of the allegations is, it can't do well, the job. It got, can't get to the bottom point he, he's given them all of the allegations he's given them all the information he just hasn't given them the, the names right. but sorry i shouldn't have even brought that up because <laughs> it's diverted us Alice, yeah, i just want to, to say on uh, the post office scandal i mean the added frustration about all of this is why we we know these people have been wronged and, and why we're we being so slow in getting them compensation yeah. again and yeah. again we see this with the contaminated blood scandal we know these people have been wronged yet people have died without receiving mm. compensation we know they're owed the, the british state is sclerotic and it's broken yeah, the contaminated blood scandal is coming to a head now. I mean, the money will come up pretty quickly. Uh, that There is a determination that that gets paid up this year. Well, we have a suggestion here for our fun question at the end of the programme, which I'm going to challenge people to beat. <laughs> it's from oh. Jane, who says, My dog has fleas. They constantly irritate him. What endless irritation does the panel wish would vanish? If you can do better than that, we'll replace that, that as the final up. question. <laughs> And we'll take some more questions from you in a moment. 0345 6060 973. It's 16 minutes past eight. This is LBC. UK. Leading Britain's conversation. Cross question with Ian Dale. Alexa, send a comment to LBC. 17 minutes past eight. With us on the panel are Lord Marland, Alice Denby, Kevin Craig and Jonathan Liss. Peter says, uh, should conversion therapy be under medical regulation and should a new Labour government enact the European Convention on the Rights of the Child in respecting the maturity and views 
of a child. Now, the long-awaited review by Dame Hilary Cass into how the NHS cares for children with gender dysphoria will be published tomorrow and is expected to say that these children may be suffering from mental health problems and should be offering of a counselling instead of automatically being directed towards puberty blocker drugs. A really difficult one, this, Kevin. Yeah, that's it. And <laughs> it's impossible. I, I actually don't know what I think. I mean, I think that the idea that anyone should be forced to undergo any form of uh, treatment or therapy for issues like this, I can't get my head around it. Should it be banned? I would have thought so. Um, do I think that these sorts of issues are being weaponised by some? you know, in public discourse. Yes, I do. Um, but very difficult. I mean, my, my simplistic view is one of kindness and understanding in all forms of public life and politics and, you know, not condemning people for being different. That's where I start. I'm hugely relaxed about people's personal choices in terms of how they live their own lives. Um, do I think we need to, you know, make sure that young people have space to take the right decisions? Yes. But I just find the, the the public discourse around this in some quarters really depressing. Alice. Yeah, I can. I think the public debate on this issue is completely toxic on both sides. I think um, there are extremists um, on both sides, and, and actually, most people I think are somewhere in the middle on this. On the conversion therapy issue specifically, I actually remember attending a focus group on this a long time ago when the Tories were first thinking about doing it, and it was very much around um, sort of religious and Christian conversion for gay people, sort of you know praying the gay away, which wasn't a particularly controversial thing. I think it's been made controversial by the idea that it might make it difficult for gender questioning children to access therapy that might sort of allow them to talk about um, about their gender identity but with or without affirming it. That seems to me a tricky one. I mean, of course, as you say, children should have space to be able to talk and think and, 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 and any decision... Um, they should it should be made extremely carefully. Any medical interve intervention should should be a very serious thing, and it should be considered really carefully. So, I think this is an extremely complicated issue. We're going to see in the CAS review tomorrow um, what the recommendations are. I think it's clear that that there have been um, mistakes made at, at, around gender questioning children at the Tavistock Centre, and we need to get this right because you know gender questioning children aren't going to go away. Jonathan. This is obviously, it's a hugely, hugely difficult issue. I think that um, if you're talking about conversion therapy for gay people, I think that is a very, very simple question, that absolutely there is nothing wrong with being gay. And it is very, very damaging when people are given therapy, forcibly um, given therapy in many cases, uh, to sort of de-gay themselves. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you saw, you know, in the... But, but what about where it's not forced? Because I'll always remember... In a phone in a few years ago on this subject, a middle-aged man phoned in and he was clearly very distraught. I mean, he, re he knew he was gay, but he didn't want to be gay. And he said, what is the harm of me going to somebody voluntarily to say, well, to effectively, as he would have put it, cured him of being gay? I mean, obviously, I wouldn't use that, that word, but that's what he used. Um, should, should he be denied that service if he wishes to pay for it. I think that there there are very, you know, I am absolutely in favour of personal choice and I hate um, nanny statism uh, in, in all its forms and I, and I generally don't like banning things. And I think that there is something here that kind of crosses into the line of, of medical ethics because if you are seeking that service, um, you are therefore seeking a service from someone who should be subject to a kind of statutory or, or kind of um, a, a trade body like regulation. Uh, and that the, though those bodies should make clear that this is uh, a service without medical data that has uh, that has data that shows it's incredibly damaging for people, and that therefore the service should not legally um, be offered under that body under that umbrella. But yes, I do have sympathy with the idea that for some people it is a very very distressing thing. Um, but you know there are a lot of um, sort of medical procedures uh, which which people might want to have which are not um, you know available to them, and that's a, that's a different ethical issue. When it comes to trans conversion therapy. I think that anyone should be entitled to therapy if they're feeling distressed about some aspect of their lives. 
But this is something different. This is about pathologizing people. This is about telling people that if the way they feel about themselves is wrong, that's what we're talking about here. And again, I think that should be subject to the same kind of, of, of rigorous scrutiny um, that, we're, that we would apply to gay people. Look, I remember, uh, you know, if I can give a personal anecdote, when I was three years old, I think, you know, I sort of, I think because I had older sisters and I sort of briefly thought that I wanted to be a girl as well. And, you know, my father, his response was to send me to, I don't remember this, but his response was to send me to a psychiatrist. At and the it age didn't of three. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Wow. I think so. And it, I think it didn't have like, I, it, I, I don't feel that it was a traumatic episode, but looking back from, you know, 30 odd years later, that was, you know, that was, that we'd see, I think that's a, 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 such a, a misguided approach. And that actually, when children are questioning their gender, Rather than pathologizing them, medicalizing them, panicking, sending them to therapy, actually, you say, you, you support them, you listen to them. And if they actually want to, for example, live uh, in, in a different quote unquote gender or wear different clothes or go by a different name, actually, you, you let them do it. And often, often those children change their minds. They change their minds. It's not for them. The worst thing you can do is to push back on it, to fight it, say you're wrong, you're misguided, you're being insincere. Because actually, as much as anything, that will actually often make the child even more resolute that that's what they want to be. There's nothing wrong with being gay and there's nothing wrong with being trans either. No, I completely agree with you, but I think it's just an extreme and possibly damaging reaction to say to a three-year-old child, a boy in a dress, you are a girl now and we're going to call you uh, uh, female pronouns from the age of... I, that's, I not what, that's not what I'm saying, though. I'm not saying that... I'm not, I think that there is obviously an age at which you start to do that, but I think that we, there, we have to deal with the extremes here <laughs> and that sort of sending someone to a therapy... Yeah, I'm saying the, the, there are extremes on both sides and absolutely I, I think we're on the same page that it should be um, that you should be able to explore it, you should absolutely not told that it's wrong and um and that there's something wrong with you Listen. but you should but it should be a kind of listening understanding exploring space to let children decide and it's an incredibly difficult position for parents to be in i mean i i, I think we all try and put ourselves in that position i think well how would we mm. react in that situation and again from a phone in on this i remember um a, a mother phoned in and i think her child was seven and she said, I know my child was born into the wrong body. Mm. So I, I can't sort of castigate my child. Mm. I can't criticise my child. I can't try and persuade my child because I know that what they're telling me is 100% genuine. Jonathan Marland. Well, I've got nothing to add, really. I'm sort of different generation from the rest of you. Uh, and I haven't had to first-hand cope with this situation, if coping is the right word. I, you know, my children have not wanted to do that. My grandchildren aren't. Um, so I haven't got first-hand knowledge of it. But I, I think there's a, a strand in everything that all three of you have said, you know, that being sensible, not rushing into the decisions, uh, giving people the opportunity to change the mind. In some ways, this could be a trend, a fashion at the moment, uh, in which case it needs, as Jonathan says, to be handled very carefully and to play, play that out. And, and there certainly shouldn't be a rush to medical... Uh, uh, um, procedures. Procedures, thank you, In As always, you've got the mot juste. Um, <laughs> there shouldn't be a rush to medical procedures. Time should play play out, and, and people should, in their own minds, adjust to what it is. And I'm not not against or for it. I mean, but can you imagine the outcry that there will be tomorrow if, if the reports are from the CAS report are true, that she says that there are mental health issues here. Well, there's going to be an outcry. I can there's, just imagine there's, there's what the reaction to, be, to that is going There's to going to be an outcry, whatever she says, let's be fair, because that is what happens at the moment. Mm. Mm. But it, it, it's it, it's a whole new thing for my generation. We, we you know, I'm in my nearly 70, but we had, we had um, homosexuality was the main thing that we, we, we had to confront with. You know, for most of us, it was just a sort of, you know, not a problem. But uh, for others, it was a very, very clear conviction because it was illegal. It had been a, uh, you know, the church had been telling people for years it was mm. wrong. I, I, I know it, personally, is. it never, never um, uh, sort of, it never 
even thought about. And, uh, but, did, you, uh, did you not go to a public school? <laughs> <laughs> I, I did, I did, and that's why I never really thought of it. You know, I was perfectly, perfectly accustomed to gay men. <laughs> But, but, but I, think, I, I wasn't persuaded, by the way. <laughs> I think it's a good point, though. I think we are seeing a repeats of some of the kind of gay panics we've seen in, in the past. Yeah, um, I think that's my point, Alice. Yeah. Uh, um, and, and I think that this debate could do with a lot less Agreed. heat. Because um, there, there does seem to be a, a sort of... It's, it's like everyone used to trot out this canard that, oh, well... Um, so don't bend over in the showers as, as if every gay <laughs> man mm. fancied every other man that exists which and we there all know there, is there an true. intrinsic threat as yeah. well mm. and I say, I know that absolutely there is a moral panic going on in this issue um, and it's it's, it's really unfortunate, this idea, because we're seeing the same way, in that the gay men, you know, in the 80s were seen as there was a there was an, an instinctive suspicion of paedophilia, especially. Yeah. And that sort of, you know, if there was one gay man who turned out to be paedophile, then that sort of just, well, there you go. And the same thing is now being applied to trans women in particular, that they are sort of going to be sex offenders in some way. Interesting yeah. anecdote there. I remember having dinner, I won't name him, but with a fairly senior Conservative politician at a Conservative Party conference, and this this was, oh, come on, I what think, was his name? No, I, no, I, I nearly did it, but I'm not, I'm not going to tell you in the break, uh, which our listeners always hate it when I say things like that. We but, all hate it when you say But, it but we, it, I think this is when the, the whole sort of gay adoption thing was going on, and the Conservative Party was, as usual, tying itself up in knots about this yeah. issue. And this particular politician um, said to the rest of the table, well, you just have to think of the children, don't you? And I turned around to him and I said, what do you mean by that? Well, it's obvious what I mean. I said, no, the implication of that is that you think that all gay men are paedophiles and therefore would prey on the children. I said, surely, in gay adoption, the, the main thing is that the children have loving parents, whether they're uh, a man and a woman, man and a man, or a woman and a woman. It's better than being in care. That's the key thing here, isn't it? Mm. And over the years, he's come to, shall we say, modify his views on, on those issues. But that was a fairly mainstream Mm, mainstream yeah. belief but, Ian, but you know we've been indoctrinated for years ago. we've been indoctrinated for years by the church by um, the law that it was illegal so yeah. mm. uh, well come on come on Jonathan yeah, your so, party was advocating uh, had a three line whip on section 28 as late as 2000 I believe you know the Conservative Party had a long time in which to get its head around the fact that homosexuality was not some abomination and it took a very very long time for David Cameron to begin to make those steps to actually normalise it you know I remember growing up but actually took the Labour Party no, they didn't even do it so well, no, that's not true Labour Party, the Labour Party they, wanted to try to try to overturn Section 28 as soon as it came into power and it kept on being blocked in the House of Lords by Conservative peers. Yeah, but the, know, the, the Conservative Party, the did, did, you know, this isn't a party political thing, there's no point sort of saying this or that. It, it's, it's, a, it's, it's how we were, how you were brought up in those days and, you know, if I was to say to my mother, who's 94, she'd have a a sort of very entrenched view of this that generation do. Yeah, so it's, this, it's, this, it's, it's not a, it's, this is Kevin, not a, a, a sort of party political thing. I, th I think our society and our country has undergone huge change in attitudes in the recent oh, decades. Right. And I think there is now a consensus which I would hope comes into play when tomorrow's announcement comes out for, I think, across the spectrum, kindness, common sense, case by case basis and try to let's try and avoid hysteria the past is the past you know of, of course it was you know there's also in recent decades some of the attitudes around were terrible but we we are in a better place as a country and i just i want to hold on to that optimism because sometimes as alice said the heat and hysteria mm. is just unnecessary and unhelpful mm. Mm. but i do think that in i do think that in 30 years time we'll look back on our current discussions of trans people with much the same sort of cringeworthy horror that we do our discussion about gay people 30 well, years jonathan ago. and i won't because we'll be dead Oh, yeah, of course. Oh, no, you're no, no, you're, 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 you're I'll be 97. I'll be, I'll be fine, mate. Don't you worry. <laughs> well, if your mother's 94, you're, you're, you've got a happy future to look forward to. Right, we're going to take some more questions on some very different subjects in just a moment with our panel. But if you'd like to add to them, 0345 6060 973. It's 832 News Headlines on LBC with Josh Bancroft. The Deputy Secretary-General of NATO has told LBC the UK needs to prepare for conflict in the future in a more dangerous world. In an exclusive interview, Mircha Jonah has told us Russia can't be trusted and Ukraine will join NATO in the future. 
An MP has resigned the Tory whip after admitting he passed the numbers of fellow politicians to a scammer. William Ragg will sit as an independent and had already confirmed he will not be standing at the next election. And the scientist behind the concept of the subatomic particle, the Higgs boson, Professor Peter Higgs, has died. He was 94. LBC weather clear for most overnight with some showers and strong winds in Northern Ireland, a low of freezing. This week on LBC. Thanks, Joe. Always love you to hear from you. Thanks for calling. Sarah, thanks for the question. Join me, Rishi Sunak, as I take your calls on LBC. As someone who works seven days a week and has paid into the tax system since I left school without claiming a penny back from it, why do I feel like I'm being unfairly punished? Jack, the best way for me to help you is to bring inflation down. Bearing in mind I'm in my early 30s, I don't really want to be paying it off until I'm in the grave. The Conservatives are at rock bottom in the polls, and now it's your chance to put your questions to the man in charge. When's the general election going to be? I just want to know what your plan is for education. I just need to feel safer. I want more police. Put your questions to the Prime Minister. Rishi Sunak, live and exclusive. This week on Nick Ferrari at Breakfast. This is LBC. Question with Ian Dale on LBC. We have with us on our panel Lord Jonathan Marlon, Conservative, um, sorry, Conservative <laughs> peer, nearly got that one wrong, and former minister. Now you chair the Commonwealth Enterprise and Investment Council. Uh, what, what does that involve doing? Lots of travelling to Commonwealth countries, I imagine. Uh, it does, huge amount. I've just done. Uh, 11 flights in 13 days. Really? Yeah. Quite, I wouldn't like that. Isn't that fun? No. Um, it's a networking organisation, uh, 56 countries in the Commonwealth. Uh, I've always felt when I was involved in the trade agenda in the Cameron coalition uh, that the Commonwealth was one of Britain's greatest assets. And so what we've done is try to develop that asset in bringing trade and prosperity through the Commonwealth. How, how do you do that? Because I mean, obviously, uh, there's a different countries are have different systems. Yeah, some are democracies, some are less than democratic. Some believe in fr sort of free trade, others don't particularly. How do you bring all that together? Well, I think that uh, you, you bring it all together by just bringing people in the room and say, you know, try and work out whether you can do deals together. Because in the end, it's to the benefit each country in the Commonwealth understands that trade is at the root to prosperity. They just have different ways of getting there, and the way, our job is to respect those ways and try and encourage what uh, are perceived as better ways, but without forcing them, because it's up to uh, each country to uh, establish that, and uh, to 
to present opportunities. So it's it's a very big networking uh, event uh, and organisation, and we provide we we have events throughout the year which bring them all together. I mean, it's actually sorry, just uh, Ian. I don't want to, you know, it's it's a very amazing thing. At the last Commonwealth Heads of Government, we had thirty five heads of state at our Commonwealth Business Forum, which I happily co-host. Thirty five heads of state. We had the president of FIFA, president of the World Bank, chairman of this, chairman of that and the other. 1,200 delegates about um, three months after lockdown uh, all converged in Rwanda. Uh, so it shows you there is a real compelling um, aspect to the Commonwealth. And my only sadness is the UK government hasn't yet switched on to this incredible opportunity in a post-Brexit Britain. Alice Denby is here, Opinion and Features Editor of City AM. You moved to, to City AM from CapEx. It must be different working for a daily newspaper, I guess. Yeah, I mean, it's, it is it is different. It's I, th- I think like any journalist, being in print, there's a real a real thrill to seeing what you've worked on the day before being printed and uh, people reading it on the tube. Um, but yeah, it's, you know, it's hard work, but I'm really enjoying it. And Jonathan List, political commentator. Now, how have you found your role changing over the years? Well, so can I firstly say that when you introduced me as a Labour activist, Ian, I took exception to that because I spent... You did, you not, did. I just... Well, I, re- I read your Twitter feed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm certainly on the left, but I'm not affiliated with the Labour Party uh, in any way. I was a registered supporter at one point uh, before the, the leadership elections. I've never been a member, and I'm certainly not in any kind of co- you know, communication with them. Uh, but I started my, my this kind of career, I suppose, um, as you will remember, as a, a Remain activist, and then... Um, so if you try as a soft Brexit activist and, and then a second referendum person, all of which failed miserably. <laughs> but I feel, I feel like I've been re- reasonably vindicated in what's happened since, but let's not go down that no, particular route. Not. But yeah, so, uh, you know, look, obviously... I mean, what I'm really asking is when are you going to get a proper job? Oh, now you sound like my mother. <laughs> um, never. I'm enjoying my current one too much, actually. And um, Kevin, you are uh, Chief Executive of the Public Relations Agency, PLMR, but you're also Labour candidate for Central Suffolk and North Ipswich. Yeah. Now, that uh, what, what's the, what majority are you up against? Because it's a new seat, isn't it? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's got lots of old parts in it, but it's, uh, I mean, it's historically a very, very conservative seat. But, you know, I'm running there to, um, I have an office in Ipswich in, in the company I founded. Um, mm. How and, convenient. Well, you know, and also family across East Anglia, but I'm really just, I wanted to make sure I was part of the general election effort and to give people a choice, and it's it's good to be involved, and I've done that before, and, you know, as you'd expect, Ian, I, I think we desperately need a change in this country, and I wanted to be really involved in that. And does that provide any sort of conflict with clients? Because obviously we've got a Conservative government at the moment... Mm. I um, mean, looking at your Twitter feed, it's sort of you, you've got your your party colours nailed to the yeah, mast. Yeah. There, yeah. does that ever provide a difficulty for N- you? N- no, I mean, I'm sort of my my role is very much a, a leadership and sort of you know, watching the money now for the company. I started it many years ago, and there's a hundred colleagues across the country. Um, there's no conflict. I mean, it's the reality is whatever one makes of it that there is the business sector in this country now. Um, it's just where we are. There's a huge appetite for them to to engage with the Labour Party, mm. not not so much with the Conservative Party. But you know, uh, in my political life, I don't think we should take anything for granted. Um, and there's no elections been won yet. This is not over. It's not done. And people need to keep hearing about you know why Labour and the difference it can make. So there's a long way to go yet, I think, Ian. OK, well, let's go to another question. It's from James in air. James, very good evening to you. What would you like to ask? Oh, good evening, Ian. Um, I wondered whether the panel would agree with me that, that in general terms in the past 10 years or so, there has been a redistribution of wealth, assets and resources, other resources, from the younger generation to the older generation. What what evidence do you have that that has indeed happened? I, I, I feel, well, for example, the difficulty that young people have in getting on the housing ladder, the fact that we seem to tax work now more than we tax wealth, the fact that I cannot understand why the triple lock and pension should be guaranteed, um, and I cannot also understand why pensioners do not pay national insurance. 
Well, just as a bit of background to this, the state pension rose by 8.5% yesterday as part of the triple lock policy, despite concerns by some financial experts that that policy will soon become unaffordable. Um, Alice, let's come to you first. Yeah, I agree with Given everything. Given that you're from City AM. <laughs> I agree with absolutely everything James has said, and I suppose I should say um, that I consider myself young. I'm, I'm 37, but the difficulty that people have getting on the housing ladder, starting families, meaning means that people have this kind of extended neoteny. Um, you say... You younger and and much less secure for much longer. I think um, that we have a generation that hoarded opportunities, were lucky to benefit from housing wealth um, and who now sort of sit around on... Oh, I don't want to be... I don't want to... Um, but sit around the golf course and say we've paid in all our lives when in fact they have this protection in the triple lock that is completely unaffordable. If we carry on spending the way we are on benefits and healthcare for pensioners in 50 years' time will be spending a trillion pounds. That is more than we currently spend on everything put together. Um, it's completely unsustainable. Everybody knows it is. The reason why no politician will do anything about it is because pensioners loyally and dutifully come out in hordes to vote. Um, I think by some projections, this next, this coming election is going to be the f- for the first time when over 55s make up a majority of voters who actually turn out on voting day. They're an incredibly politically powerful force. Um, and that's why they get these bribes. Um, and I think we need to do much more to help young people to get on the housing ladder, to help people start families, to, to help to make childcare more affordable, uh, and, to, and to, as James says, uh, reduce taxes on work. As, as a relatively young person yourself, Jonathan... Oh, yes. Uh, that, relatively, Jonathan. Relatively. Uh, um, that Jonathan. Uh, do, you, do, you agree, do you agree with that analysis? I agree with a lot, a lot of what Alice has said, yeah. And I, look, I, I don't think that it's helpful to kind of have battles between generations and to sort of pit one Sorry. pit one to pit groups of the of society against each other you know sort of pensioners would argue um, that you know that a lot of pensioners not all pensioners but pensioners would argue the young people ought to have the same opportunities as they had it's not as though they've deliberately sort of kept opportunities or deliberately stolen um, from the younger generations but clearly younger generations have been shafted and like, I remember I, I was you know the, the year I left university you know very short you know, around that time you know, we had the financial crash and I sort of feel like I was in the very, very last cohort where you could just about manage uh, in, in society and sort of after that you had you know, austerity, you had obviously then Brexit, COVID and sort of a range and we still, the economy still hasn't recovered. Uh, we have the, the biggest wage stagnation decades, the biggest drop in living standards uh, on record and people don't have the same opportunities or incentives that they would have had. When you look at people, you know, sort of, you know, over the age of 60 who complain about young people, that they don't want to work anymore, that they have too many, too much avocado toast, to watch too much Netflix. And then that you ask them how much their first house cost. And it was sort of £7,000 in 1960. And it was you know, maybe sort of three or four times um, their salary. And it seems unthinkable now that until the 70s, 80s, even 90s in some cases, you could be uh, have a very, very ordinary job and afford a house and garden. And you might have a partner who didn't even have to work. You could afford just to look after, you could just you know, look after children all day, for example. And that is simply unthinkable for huge numbers of people in my generation. And someone has to take accountability for that. And the Conservatives are finding that actually young people are not prepared to give them the benefit <coughs> of the doubt anymore and young people are becoming a sort of a more politically active force. I think that you might actually have a lot of young people voting this election to kind of kick the Tories, which they absolutely deserve. So is it the case of that old people have taken, there's been a redistribution of wealth from young to old? I'm not sure if I'd phrase it quite like that, but certainly young people have been completely frozen out of the economy in many ways and they simply won't have the opportunities that were taken for granted by people uh, even 30 years ago. Kevin Craig. Yeah, I think I, I would echo the, the... I think we and need to be careful about using words like bribes, OK? I think, <laughs> I think people, people, groups always vote for the policies that they think favour them and their families and, you know, their, their life. Um, and I think, you know, a lot of pensioners that I see are not uh, larging it up with a load of money. And this, I, I, I meet a lot of pensioners who are still on the breadline. But, but as a group, they are the richest cohort in society and obviously there are, there's pension and poverty I, I completely get that yeah. but if you divide society up into groups pensioners are the richest yeah yeah and we've talked about housing being a huge part of that and there's a huge amount of housing wealth and you can't now um 
it's as recent as the late 90s, actually, Jonathan, where you could, on an average job as a young person, buy a home in London. That was still doable. So it's, I, I understand why things feel very out of reach. And that's why there just needs to be some really fundamental changes in how this economy works. Because, you know, I run a company now with lots of people and it's fantastic, but I, I grew up in very different circumstances. And our politics needs to offer to every generation that chance to transform their life and those they care about. And if it doesn't, people are going to get fed up. And there is a point, you know, and there might be many reasons for it, but the, 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 the demographics of young people voting Conservative are are terrible. And I think this is part of that conversation. And Alice has been very modest. She wrote a very good piece on this the other day. And I, 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 I get it. I get why a lot of young people are really angry. Jonathan. Well, uh, I've been around for so long that I've seen lots of 10-year periods. And of course, because I've been around for so long, I, when I first started work, it was all dead man's shoes. You had to wait till someone die before you got promotion, which is not the situation now. And happily, in my business career, I was able to change that. Um, I, you know, when I started, interest rates were best if you wanted to borrow for a mortgage, 12%. Uh, tax was as high as it is now. Um, unemployment was very bad. Um, it was very difficult to get a job. And, uh, it, you know, there was a lot of challenge. So I, I think comparing this with that is a totally is totally erroneous, actually, because um, 10 years is a very short cycle in a lifetime. Where, where I agree uh, is that the pension age is far too young, uh, that governments have not moved on with pension ages as quickly as people's lifespan, so we're copying it in terms of the NHS, we're copying in terms of pension costs, as you say, I mean, it is absolutely ridiculous that 60-year-olds get free bus passes in London, um, you know, the, where they potentially going to live for another 20 years. Don't you mess years. with my senior mm -hmm. rail car well, discount. I, you know, I'm afraid I, it, I'm messing with my own senior rail, but I personally would think it, it's ridiculous. I don't think uh, the pension age has moved in step with people's longevity of life. It's not exclusive, obviously, but in the average life term when pension age of 65 was fixed is far higher now than it was. Uh, and that is why we're bearing this huge cost. You can't blame the pensioners for it. And you can't blame the pensioners actually for getting an 8% increase because we've had cost of living uh, rises in the last two years of 14%. And that's this is not even keeping up with that. So for those people who are, uh, who are reliant upon their pension, it's not a huge amount of money what they're earning. And it's quite right that they should get an increase. I mean, I don't, okay. know, I don't think that we should object to, to pensioners getting uh, an inflationary increase exactly. in their pensions. Yeah. The problem is that other people in the economy aren't seeing those increases. That's why we obviously saw the, the strikes over the last year. But young people are simply not getting the same benefits. I think that's the point. Yeah, no, but you're saying, you're saying, you're saying very, very large increases in people's we're salaries. We're very late to go to a break. And we obviously want to fit in our fun question at the end. So uh, I'm going to draw this to a close. It's 10 to 9. This is LBC.
slash info. Cross Question with Ian Dale on LBC. Right, James in New Malden is our next caller. James, very good evening. What's your question, please? Good evening. Winston Churchill said, give us the tools. The NATO General has Secretary has said, we should be preparing for war. We had surplus typhoon air-to-air that Mr Lezent has to do with. Why aren't we giving them to him and doing more ourselves? Are they really surplus? Now, the NATO Deputy General Secretary, Misha Jonah, spoke exclusively to LBC today, and we'll be taking your calls on his warnings after nine this evening. Um, Jonathan Liss, let's start with you on this. Do, do you think that... I mean, he isn't the first to warn that we should be preparing for war. The head of the army said we are the pre-war generation. Do you take these warnings seriously? I think that if anyone in a senior position is saying this, then we have to take it seriously. I, as with, as in the case of all of us, I'm not privy to the private intelligence which um, shows how much Russia, because I presume we're talking about Russia rather than anyone else, is preparing to expand its aggressive um, actions or its military capabilities with regards to the rest of Europe uh, or abroad or further afield. Um, it seems unlikely at the moment, I think, that Russia would be invading anyone else. And obviously Putin has said repeatedly that he's not planning to uh, ex you know, expand the war, but obviously you would take that with a pinch of salt. I think that there is obviously a reason, you could argue, why um, the senior military commanders might be sort of talking up the prospect of war, uh, because obviously it's in their interest to expand military spending as well and to make the public more aware and alert of the dangers that we face. And, you know, also, you know, I think you had the Estonian Prime Minister who said that it was possible that NATO would be at war with Russia within the space of five years. I think it's interesting that those comments are being made publicly as well, not just in the Chancelleries of Europe. Um, so that suggests a, a kind of a, an openness to talk about it uh, and a, an open and a willingness to scare people as well, because people are obviously going to be scared if you're talking about the idea of a nuclear power maybe invading NATO and therefore drawing NATO into a war with Russia. But I think I would just say, you know, make the point that has been made many times before that the UK in particular will do everything in its power to avoid being drawn into a war with Russia which could actually spell you know global annihilation that is not in anyone's interest I think that we should all be very very careful about de-escalating the situation even as we remain absolutely steadfast in our support for Ukraine. Right, we haven't got a lot of time left, so if you can keep your answers relatively brief. Kevin? Well, yeah, I think um, we should be worried, and um, uh, I think that uh, I'm very encouraged by uh, what John Healy says, that if there is a change of government, we'll do a full defence re review on day one. Whatever kind of conflict emerges, our armed forces are 75,000 roughly. They used to be 100,000. I'm not sure that's wise or sustainable. And yes, anybody with an ounce of sense will share these concerns. Um, but, you know, we need to be vigilant, we need to de-escalate, but, you know, you look at the comments of the potential next president of the United States of America, and it's also very worrying. Jonathan? I, I think the whole thing's very frightening, that uh, any country can wage war on another. Um, the whole thing's sort of infathomable in a way, in the same way that uh, the Israel-Gaza situation is unfathomable to people like me. So unfathomable things do happen and can happen, and if they escalate, which uh, happily they, you know, well, it's very, they're very unhappy situations, but happily they're sort of contained at the moment. Uh, but if they go beyond that, then it is a really frightening prospect. Alice? Yeah, I, I think we're clearly facing a very dangerous world, and I think that uh, politicians, uh, for example, like in the SNP, who uh, talk about getting rid of our nuclear deterrent, are looking incredibly foolish. Yes. But it, in the end... I mean, do you think that the political class, do you think that the general public are willing to have this debate about increased defence spending? Because to my mind, defence is going to be the big policy issue of the next 10 years. But I don't see any readiness among all sorts of different groups I to think, even acknowledge that. I think there's reluctance across the board to talk about the necessary trade-offs. I mean, sorry to go back to the pensioners issue, but we never talk about how we're going to fund social care because yeah. we just put it off till the, after the election. We are not honest with the public about what we can afford and what our priorities should be. We just pretend that we can keep on spending as we are when we know it's unsustainable. If people are told, this is a good point, that the government has to do things to keep the people safe, they'll listen to the conversation here, and I give the British people a lot of credit, and they know 
that it costs. Well, it certainly does, uh, but that's part of the problem in that um, Jonathan and I can remember the days of Sir Peter Levine being brought in to solve NHS... Sorry, no, <laughs> not the a, NHS. There's a Freudian slip. <laughs> uh, to solve defence procurement under exactly. Margaret Thatcher. Exactly. And we're still having the same debate today about the fact that the Minister of Defence is so good at wasting people's money. Right, our final question. It is from Jane. It is about dogs. It is about fleas. She says, my dog has fleas. They constantly irritate him. Which endless irritation does the panel wish would vanish? Kevin Craig. Well, I'm going to make it light, Ian, but there's a point underneath, which is Liz Truss, OK? I think the lack of emotional <laughs> intelligence and self-awareness in the worst Prime Minister in living memory really would encourage her to keep a low profile. I know, I think you've seen her recently, OK? But has anybody ever been so loud, having achieved so little and caused so much damage that people in this country are paying for? Well, can I recommend that you listen to the programme <laughs> next Monday when you'll be able to hear my uh, rather lengthy interview with Liz Truss. As a, and I've actually read her book, but one of the few people to have done so so far. And there are, it's actually, shall I say, a little bit surprising. But that's all I am permitted well, to say. She, the, the, the question was about irritation. Uh, anyway, I, she's I, lost I, the I don't, I don't think we should personalise this thing. Uh, certainly, I find the 20 miles an hour... Um, speed limit incredibly irritating particularly when i go into wales i don't know how it's tolerated in wales controversial alice well i'm sorry i know i've alienated all your pensioner listeners and i'm going to alienate both jane and anyone else uh, who's a dog lover my irritation is dogs no um, yes oh, no. i'm sorry no. um, they're you, yappy oh, no. they're slobbery they're covered in fleas and in where i live in london they defecate all over the streets um, sounds like so, some people i've met on dating sites <laughs> <laughs> Oh dear. I'm never going to be invited back. No, Alice, <laughs> it's been nice knowing you. I've got that somewhere to go at Christmas, end. Alice. Um, <laughs> Jonathan, I'm dreading this now. The Daily Express. Um, it's beyond a joke now. It's It's gone from performance art to just national embarrassment. For years, you had a, a Diana headline uh, every single Monday. Then it was Madeleine McCann. And now it's um, it's either Meghan Markle or it's just saying how great uh, either Brexit or Rishi Sunak is going to be once they actually uh, manage to um, get started. And I think just some, sometimes you just have to call, cut your losses and say it was very nice to have known you, but maybe, maybe it's time to vanish. OK, Jonathan, <laughs> Alice, Kevin and Jonathan, thank you very much for coming in today. Now, on tomorrow's panel, we have the Liberal Democrat peer, Baroness Olly Grender, the Spectator's political journalist, James Heal, the barrister and former Conservative MP, Jerry Hayes, and the imam and broadcaster, Ajmal Mazrua. I think that might be quite a lively one. Now, in the next hour, we are going to return to the subject of defence and ask you this question. How should we prepare for these even greater tensions with Russia. We've had the uh, Deputy Secretary General of NATO issuing some dire warnings today on Tom Swarbrick's programme. We'll play you a little bit of what he had to say and get your reaction. Do you, do you agree with me that defence is going to be one of the big policy issues for debate over the next 10 years or am I, as usual, going to be accused of being a warmonger? 0345 6060 973, that's the number to call here on LBC. On your radio, on Global Player, and Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation, this is LBC. LBC.